So um, this talk is going to be, I assembled a bunch of slides uh, to give you all examples of how X-ray spectroscopies uh, can be simulated with linear response TDTFT, specifically Zanes, across a whole range of um, molecular and material systems. And I should emphasize that I'm not a soil scientist by training, but in discussing with Amity and Sharon when we started this project, we realized that there was a lot of common questions that can potentially be answered with techniques like this. So the purpose of this specific part of the talk, this, this talk is essentially to give you a diverse set of examples where we've actually looked at it since we've developed this, say for the last seven years or so, just to give you an example of how we've actually utilized this technique in different arenas and showing you, basically show you some of the flexibility and the versatility of the approach in teasing out some of the molecular scale information like uh, Sharon showed in her previous talk. But I'll show you how this can actually help you um, tease out information across a, a, a broad range of complexes as well. Does it transition? No. Do you see a next slide? Eventually done. Um, by NWCAM, which is an open source code, like I mentioned to you earlier, and it's available on a GitHub site, and it's developed and maintained at PNNL, and you can install this on your uh, own cluster at your institution, as well as it's installed on the Amazon supercomputer, as well as supercomputing resources across this country. And if there are specific questions regarding NWCAM and how to download it and specifics like this, we could probably take this offline or during the discussion session to talk about. But this is an important capability that lives in EMSL, in fact, and it's installed on all the supercomputers facilities that we have available at PNL. So to reinforce this high level X-ray primer, like I would like to call what Sharon showed nicely in her talk. So for those who are uninitiated, so this is sort of just the general uh, look of what an X-ray spectrum looks like. So you have something that spans like 500 electron volts. And uh, do you see my uh, cursor? Let me yes, we do. Do you see the cursor? Okay, yeah, pointer options later. Okay, so, so this region is where the chemically relevant information is, in fact, and what, uh, what we were seeing earlier in Sharon's talk, where actually the bonding environment is actually revealed in this early part. This later part is called the XAFs, and it's typically done with people that who have used FEF, for example, and this is simulated with multiple scattering, for example, and FEF does a fantastic job with that. So now the early part of this part is, is typically simulated with electronic structure codes like, uh, or methodologies like TDFT or some other higher level um, uh, ab initio quantum chemistry approach. And NWCAM being a quantum chemistry code, we have a suite of theories that we can use and we develop X-ray spectroscopies within the TDDFT framework, in fact, and we've been exploring it over the last few years. So one of the nice things about X-ray spectroscopy, of course, is it's because of its short wavelength, it actually gives you atomic specificity and it allows you to sort of tease about specific details about the absorbing center, like Karen was showing in the calcium. So if you tune it to the specific edge of calcium, you can potentially, you can actually excite electrons from the 1s orbital of calcium because it's tuned to that energy and inspect the bonding environment along calcium. So to drill down a little bit more, X-ray spectroscopies have has different flavors to it, depending on the edge you're exciting. And the K edge is excitations out of the 1s. The L edge are excitations out of the uh, 2s and 2p. And interestingly, as you keep going lower and lower in energy, your uh, spectrum becomes much more complicated, in fact, because of uh, several electronic structure effects, as well as spin-orbit coupling. And in fact, as theorists, we know that the theory actually becomes more complicated as you go towards lighter and lighter edges. And this kind of keeps us in business because we're constantly developing new theoretical approaches to start tackling the complicated edges, like the M edge, for example, that are more useful for some of the heavier elements, for example. So in this specific talk, I'm just going to show you examples from the K edge and the L edge that we've done and shown success with it. So the, one of the first examples that I looked at when I got into X-ray spectroscopy was to see what would, what would an oxygen K edge look like if I simulated the carbon monoxide versus water, in fact? And right away, you see the difference because carbon monoxide's virtual orbitals that you excite the 1s electron into versus the water virtual orbitals that you excited 1s electron into are completely different. So you can right away see, this was in fact very revealing to me, in fact, when I did this, to see how 
the selectivity of the X-ray spectroscopy can literally tell you what the bonding environment tells you between carbon dioxide and water. And as we've done this over the years, we've gotten more complicated. And this is another example sort of going in a little bit more in atomic number. This is an example we did recently where we collaborated with um, people looking at battery materials, in fact. So the, the point here was, of course, we were looking at these complexes in a very complicated solvent environment. And the whole idea was to understand speciation again, in line with what, uh, what Kasharan was showing in her talk, which about talking about local speciation and the bonding and how we can tease some chemical information from this. So this was a very long tour de force paper, but this particular snippet that I have here shows you the three structures that we basically sampled out of a very large scale molecular dynamic simulation. And the right side is essentially the sulfur cage. So the, the spectrum is right, this experimental spectrum is on top while you have the theoretically simulated spectrums below it, in fact, in sequence. So you right away, you realize that the, the larger complexes, the larger complexes tend to agree more with the experiment, which kind of tells you that the speciation in the solvent actually is more in the larger complexes. More importantly, this particular peak, this pre-edge peak was allowed basically is a descriptor of the terminal sulfurs, in fact, of these uh, sulfur complexes in these. So, so in fact, we, so we picked out a fingerprint in the spectrum that kind of keeps track of the terminal sulfurs, the under-coordinated sulfurs in these complexes. So this, this is an example to show you how X-ray spectroscopies can actually tell you little things like, you know, under-coordinated system, an under-coordinated atom or set of atoms inside a complex. We've also done like, Aluminium KH for aluminium, of course, is very prevalent in the environment. And this was sort of looking at, this was in fact as a part of our benchmarking when we were, when we had implemented these methods to see how well this would do across say aluminium three plus in different speciation environments. And the experimental spectrum was on top and then you have some theory at the bottom, uh, what we simulated and the sticks that you see underneath are essentially the individual roots so there were a large number of structures that we actually simulated here. That's the reason you see a forest of lines. But most importantly, you do pick up the key essential features that you see in the experimental spectrum with, the, uh, uh, with this calculation approach. One thing I'd like to point out to you is, of course, if you look at the corundum, the alpha alumina. So this A peak that you show up in the, uh, that shows up in the experiment is very interesting. If you literally take a, um, a perfect crystal and simulate a perfect crystal, you would never see that A peak because it's an essentially a transition, for, it's a forbidden transition. But the moment you in introduce some molecular dynamics into the structure, like distort the structure just a little bit, you start seeing a little A peak showing up even in the calculation. And the way to interpret that peak is you start getting forbidden transitions being allowed because of dipole mixing, for example, that allow you a certain amount of intensity. So this kind of shows you how you can assign certain very subtle features you see in the experiment with modeling, well-designed model, um, well models, and of course, tease apart the underlying physics that's going on to reveal that specific feature. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. In this, in this specific paper, we were even able to show that the chemical shifts that you see across these species was pretty much on in line and in the same direction as you would observe in the experiment. This example is again looking at the aluminum KH and its sensitivity to very, very uh, local coordination. This, this example comes from the field of catalysis where we were looking at sort of, you know, tracking the chemical transformations at a Bronsted atis acid site. So you could potentially think of an environmental system with sort of the same sort of makeup in, in a matter of speaking. So here the, the top graph has a, uh, has a water bonded to the Bronsted acid site, whereas the, in the, at the bottom picture here, you see that the water has gone away. What this allowed us to tease out was that this specific pre-edge feature was literally tracking the presence and the absence of the water. And the simple interpretation for this is when the water, present, when the water is present here, you kind of have a fourfold coordinated local site here versus when the water is absent when you basically have a threefold site. So when you have a fourfold site and if you know that silica, uh, zeolites tend to be four coordinated systems. So what ends up happening is you have a four-fold coordinated site that kind of restores the symmetry locally and the peak goes away. 
And the moment you take away a water, there's a slight bond distortion that happens that immediately causes this pre-H feature to pop up. So kind of sensitivity to local coordination and local geometries. This example is, we were interested in understanding the uh, calcium coordinate nucleation, in fact, and trying to take apart uh, how calcium coordinate, how, how calcium carbonate nucleates, in fact, in the end. And, and the, the, the details of the uh, paper of, of what we were looking at, uh, whether it were, whether calcium coordinate nucleation was following classical nucleation theory or pre-nucleated clusters is in, the, is in the science advances paper. But the key point I was trying to say, I'm trying to convey here is, we were able to simulate the calcium KH in this specific case for different kinds of speciations you would see in for calcium the early stages calcium coordinate in water. And depending on the experimental conditions, we could basically take the spectra for each of these post species and combine them in a linear way and produce a spectrum that gave us an understanding of what was actually going on in the experiment. Again, the power of X-ray spectroscopy, the Zane spectroscopy, that allows you to bring in different species and compose a total spectrum at the end of the day with input from experiment. Now, transition metal chemistry again comes up very often in environmental science. And these are, this is a classic model complex, iron hexacyanide, uh, two plus, three plus. And these are low spin systems and people in catalysis always look at these kinds of things, but looking at transition metal chemistry is common everywhere in fact. And what you can see with this kind of spectroscopy is, the X-ray spectrum of the k edge clearly tells you the coordination environment of how the electronic structure is in fact populated, the configuration of the electronic structure for the Fe2 plus versus the Fe3 plus. And we know that the Fe2 plus in a, in a low spin configuration is a closed shell, whereas Fe3 plus is a doublet. And you right away see that you see two peaks in the Fe3 plus, which tell you the arrangement of the electrons in the EG and the T2G orbitals for an octahedral complex versus just one peak here that corresponds to the empty orbital that's present in the EG for the closed shell system. So again, electronic configuration, local electronic configuration for a transition metal species. And finally, I think this is the last uh, K-edge example I've got is this is heavy element chemistry where we're not looking at the heavy element like uranium, neptunium, or plutonium, but we interrogated the system by looking at the chlorine K edge, in fact. And what you can right away see, the take home messages, you, you see a spectrum that has a shift based on the 5F shielding that you actually see in the actinides going from the uranium, neptunium, and plutonium. So th there, is a broader pick, there is a broader story behind all of this in terms of how, how actinide chemists look at covalency and so on, but that's not the, the but what, and, close, and the ligand K edge, for example, could be used as, an, as a way to probe that covalency. So this is an L3 edge, which we just recently did. And I believe this, these measurements were done at SSRL. And this is switching over to the L3. So all the examples I showed you up to now were for the K edge. Now we see the L3 edge, when you excite from the L edge, which is a 2P, you, get a wholly different profile of the spectrum. And this is a set of ruthenium two and three plus complexes that we, we, we looked at and simulated as well. And we were really happy with how, how the theory actually held itself up for uh, this class of systems. So now I'll switch gears quickly and show you something that uh, which goes to the other side, flip side of the coin, right? So well, so far we were looking at absorption spectrum, but the emission spectrum is also very interesting. And this little cartoon on the right side here kind of shows you what I mean by that. So what you have here is in the absorption spectrum, you excite from the core to some unoccupied state. But in the emission, emission spectrum, you're essentially probing the filled orbitals back to the core hole that was set up initially. So in a way, it's kind of, the, the emission spectrum gives you information not about the unoccupied orbitals, but about the filled orbitals. So if you combine emission spectroscopy with absorption spectroscopy, you in fact get a full picture of the bonding environment. The K alpha and the K beta are very common and people have done a lot of work in this area. But the one that I'm specifically focused on here is this valence to core X-ray emission, which is essentially the de-excitations of the electrons from the highest occupied molecular orbitals or you can think of this as the valence band in a solid state back to the 1s or the 2p for that matter. 
So the signals from this, from this, uh, from these spectra are actually quite small because then you need a very bright source for this. And uh, these are becoming more and more common now and, uh, and with, with, with brighter sources. And there's also, you know, lab-based experiments that are actually tackling this kind of thing, in fact, right now. So the, going back to the same uh, transition metal theme that I showed you earlier, we looked at the, uh, the 3D to 1S for a, whole, uh, for a whole range of transition metal, comp all octahedral transition metal complexes, and right away, and these are all in different oxidation states. Uh, we looked at iron, chromium, I think cobalt in this list of things. So the point here is you can actually probe the spin state of these transition metal complexes with this emission spectrum. And you, likewise, you can do the same thing for the ruthenium. Now you're, you're basically de-exciting from the 4D to the 2P. And the reason you do that is because the 1S state of ruthenium is a uh, the core hole lifetime is very, very, very short. So basically the 2P has a much longer core hole lifetime, so which is why it makes it more amenable to the spectroscopy. This is a sulfur V to C, which we did together with Jerry Seidler. We're looking at a whole range of sulfur-based complexes, hydrocarbons. And right away, you see, you can start classifying these uh, spectra based on their bonding environments just by looking at the emission spectrum. So I think this is a very powerful tool and I was really pleased when we saw this result because I think this can actually be used as a fingerprint. In fact, no, in complemented with the X-ray spectroscopy for environmental systems. This is looking at the K alpha uh, edges, basically looking at the shifts in the edges. And one can in fact see it correlates very well with the measured spectrum. So this, the shifts in the K alpha kind of give you the send, give you a feeling for the oxidation state of the system. This is a material again. So looking, if you want to look at the same thing in a solid state environment, and here we picked, uh, this is a specific case of a cathode material, uh, looking at different oxidation states of vanadium. You see it, it actually does quite well, in fact, I would say. And this, the, the point is, you know, the moment you can simulate these spectra allows you to start assigning what, you, what you're actually seeing in the experiment. Now, when you put, absorption and emission together. And I should point out, I haven't talked about the Auger, which is another process that's also seen in the X-ray spectrum, but I'm just specifically looking at when you combine absorption spectroscopy with emission spectroscopy, Siri, you have- uh, I'm just giving you a time call. Your time is up. Thank yeah, you. I'll be done in a slide, yeah. So when you do this, you can combine both absorption and emission, which are kind of a combination of all the spectroscopies I gave you earlier. So it kind of tells you how a excitation correlates with the emission and again, gives you a fuller picture as another way of looking at the orbitals. And we recently looked at this for the same ruthenium complexes. And this is again, looking at, uh, I think a beam line at SSRL actually, uh, which, uh, which I don't know the specific details of. So hopefully what I've given you is, the versatility of TDDFT for, a, for absorption emission as well as uh, RICS. And I think hopefully with these examples that I've given you and the examples that you'll be seeing in, in the workshop, that this approach is actually quite powerful to give you the, sen to, to probe the sensitivity and the electronic changes you see in the environment. So with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge a uh, number of, number of uh, collaborators that I've, uh, that I've worked with. Having this capability is quite powerful that allows us to collaborate with people at light sources and that has been extremely beneficial. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention.